So let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Open your Bible to the, fo- to the book Amos. Find the book Amos. If you don't know where that's at, it's in the Old Testament. It's a good place to start. Over there by Obadiah. Right? You, if you find Obadiah, that's also a real small one, though. So let's see if there's a bigger book there. Well, if you know where Daniel's at, all right? You know where Daniel's at, turn right toward the New Testament, you'll find it. If you hit Obadiah, Zechariah, those books, you're going, you've gone too far, go back. Amos, Amos, we're looking at chapter 3 and verse 3. A simple statement in this verse, but a profound truth. The Bible says in Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, Father, help us to establish where we need to be agreed with those missions, projects that we support. I pray you'll help us to lay down with clarity what the criteria is, Father, by which we evaluate missionaries and decide to commit our support to them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. <laughs> so we've come to the conclusion of my series on missions for this year. Not that I'll never preach on it again for the year, but you know, I mean, as far as this particular conference is concerned, we finish it up tonight. And we've talked about the fact that supporting missions financially is the biblical model, that it is the will of the Lord Jesus Christ that we give to missions. And we clarified that. We made it clear from the scriptures that if we're going to send them, We must support them. The Bible says, uh, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they go except they be sent? And so with our sending, we, of course, support them with our financial support. And that is the biblical model. Then we talked about biblical principles that guide us in our giving. As we're trying to discern God's will on what part we should have in the missions budget, we talked about the fact that it is an honor to participate in missions giving. Uh, that there's always the wonderful principle given, it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing, shall be given to your bosom. <laughs> that is certainly a biblical principle that applies here as it does in every aspect of our lives. Giving is, uh, is that act by God's grace in which he imparts to us that which we need in every moment of our lives, including the breath we breathe each moment and so on. And uh, we likewise need to be as our Father in heaven And we need to be giving. So giving is a a way of living that God ordained. And then there's the willingness factor, the humility factor. We talked about grace giving as opposed to giving by necessity or out of necessity. We talked about the importance that we perform on a promise. So we should not make sentimental promises, but rather be intentional in our promise and in our performance of the promise. We talked about the need to give according to what we have and not according to what we do not have. And we discussed the issue of accountability. And then we wrap all that up with a discussion on the truth that our giving is a proof of our love. And finally, the criteria by which the Lighthouse Baptist Church evaluates a mission, a missionary or a missions project and decides whether or not we can partner with them in that work. And that's the key word right up front. It's a partnership. We believe that when we take on a missionary, uh, it establishes a partnership that we intend to maintain indefinitely. There are a few instances in which we've committed for, say, six months, or we've committed for a year, or something like that. Those are special circumstances where the need is limited, it's time delimited and stuff like this, but that's rare. In most instances, when we commit to a missionary, we commit indefinitely. So let's talk about what it is then that we look at as a church when we're evaluating a missionary, trying to decide whether or not we should take them on for support. And you should know this criteria, these criteria that I'm going to lay out for you um, is something that's done before we have any missionary step into this pulpit to present his field. All right? Now, that doesn't mean if you know something or learn something, you should not bring it to our attention. Oh, don't worry about it. They've already vetted him. No, don't do that. If you know something or see something or have some concern... It's, it's obligatory on your part to say something uh, so you, because you're a member of this church, amen. And so you do have something to say about what missionaries we take on. And so you should exercise any discernment you have. And it's happened. We've had missionaries come in. We vetted it. We always vet them before they come. There's certain things they have to go through. Uh, that uh, Pastor Sanchez, I won't even get into in this message, but Pastor Sanchez knows, for example, they have to have met me uh, before they come to our pulpit. I have to have had a face-to-face with them. 
And so most, uh, many times uh, a missionary will call and say, can I, get in, can I come in and present my field and so on? And the first thing is, well, have you met Pastor Scheinbach? No, I've never met him. Well, that, you got to do that first. So, you know, where are you going to be? Here's where he's going to be. Or if you could come, you're coming through town, stop by. And well, hey, I'll have an appointment. He'll sit down and talk with you. But I have to meet the missionary face-to-face before they stand in my pulpit. Uh, and I ask them a certain battery of questions or a certain thing. I don't interrogate them. We don't get the floodlight out, you know, and get the baton in hand and uh, put them under the heat, to, you know, put them on the hot seat, so to speak. But there are some questions that I ask them, and I'm going to go over some of those questions tonight. And one of the first questions we ask them is this. Uh, do you have a Bible? And by that question, I don't mean do they carry something that has the word Bible on it. I mean, do they have a King James Bible? If they don't use a King James Bible, now obviously if they're in Korea, they're going to have to blah, blah, blah. But if their own study and their own preaching in, in English and so on, and if whatever they're doing with these other versions, if it's not founded upon, grounded upon, and guided by their understanding of what the King James Bible says, I have a problem with that. So, you know, that's just the way we roll at Lighthouse Baptist Church. They need to be King James uh, in, their, in their Bible. And why? Well, for a whole lot of reasons. And we're not going to preach a whole series on that tonight, although I will this year. Uh, we've slated a set of messages on the issue of versions scheduled for later this year. And I can't decide yet whether it's going to be Sunday nights or Wednesday nights. So pray with me that God will give me clarity on that. But that's all that's left to decide with regard to, uh, with regard to that series is when I'm going to put, you know, what slot I'm going to put it in. Let me go over it just briefly with you. Jesus said in his day that not one jot or one tittle had, up till the time he came, been lost from the Bible. Not a jot or a tittle. Now, I don't know if you know Hebrew enough to appreciate what a jot or a tittle is, but it's itty bitty. It's not much. It would be equivalent in some ways, except it has a, actually, in truth, the, in the Hebrew, the jot and the tittle have more influence on the meaning of a word than a dot of I or cross of T does, although, in some ways, it's very similar. But it would be pretty close to the idea of a dotting, a dotting the I or crossing the T. And Jesus said, effectively, that not a jot or a tittle would in any wise pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Now, we have a whole lot yet to be fulfilled. It's not all fulfilled yet. There's a whole lot more in the Scripture that's going to be fulfilled. And uh, beyond that, the Bible says that His Word is settled forever in heaven. And last time I checked, moth does not corrupt, neither can a thief steal that which is preserved in heaven. Jesus said by the Holy Spirit through uh, the the psalmist David that uh, Thy Word, O Lord, is preserved He said, thou shalt preserve it forever. So the issue of preservation is in the Bible in Psalm 12 and elsewhere. Uh, So God has made a promise to preserve his word. And he's demonstrated that, uh, well, you know, he's able. What a surprise. But you've got all those years from about 1480, somewhere in that ballpark, uh, when Moses was used by God to give us the Pentateuch. And right on down through history until Jesus came 1,400 and some change years later, and Jesus took the Bible he had uh, when he walked into the synagogue and he, and he was handed the scriptures and he opened it to uh, Isaiah 61. And when Jesus Christ read from those scripture, scriptures, I'm telling you right now that Jesus Christ knew that there was no need to correct it. There was no need to say, yeah, but there wasn't any cause for him at all to say, well, there's this, there's that. This got lost in the copyist. He didn't have any problem with just opening the Bible and reading it and believing what it said word for word. And that's the way we treat the Bible at Lighthouse Baptist Church. We open it up and we read it and we teach it. We don't have to correct it or fix it. We let it correct and fix us. It's very important to understand that it's based upon what the Bible says about itself. And it's based upon what we know about God. Uh, God, who who gave us the word, gave it for the purpose that we would have it uh, at the end of it all. He said the things that happened to them and that were written down, that happened to them, happened to them and were written down for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so if God had it written for me today, then it just stands to reason he'd make sure it was here today for me to have. Don't you think? So sanctified reason requires us to conclude that 
the preserved word of God is there. God promised he would preserve it. God commanded us to not mess with it. And God has demonstrated that he has preserved it. He demonstrated that in Jesus Christ for 1,400 and some change years. Jesus Christ testified that the word of God had been perfectly preserved. And on top of that, he promised it would continue to be perfectly jot and tittle preserved all the way until it's all fulfilled. Jesus said, my words shall not pass away. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. So I believe that there is a version available today where you will find every single word and you'll find it all jot and tittle perfect. It's there to be found. And if anybody uh, who has the Holy Ghost in them, sanctified by the Spirit of God, and prayerfully seeks, they will find. The Bible says the Holy Ghost will guide us to all truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. I can't imagine anybody uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit who cannot take hold of that promise and follow the Spirit of God, rightly discerning where the truth is to be found. And when they do that, they'll find it in the King James Bible. Again, this isn't the series I'm going to preach where we would go into all of these points in far more detail. I'm just making the point that one thing we ask our missionaries is, do you know where to find the Bible? Have you figured that out? If you don't know where to find the Bible, then that's something we can't, we can't walk together because we're not agreed, you see. Now, we might disagree on whether or not the angels that came that, uh, uh, in Genesis 6, we might disagree on whether or not those were fallen angels that intermarried or inter intermingled with the daughters of men and created these bizarre giants. Or maybe somebody thinks, well, no, I believe instead that that was the children of God mixing with the children of the world. And, and, I, and I've been asked about that over and over and over. And I say, well, let's see, where am I at on that today? Today I think it's this, and then maybe a month later I looked at it again, and I'm well, I don't know, maybe it's this. And so, quite frankly, I don't have a real solid, settled opinion on that, but I know that I'm right whenever I have one. But in any event, so my point is there, you can disagree, we can have some disagreements and still walk together, but we better be looking at the same authority. If we're going to argue about this fine point or that fine point, let's argue from the same book. Amen. And so that's our, that's our stand with regard to that. And then, and it, it's, there's far more to it, but that's all I have time for in this message. The next thing we, let, we ask them is about their mission. What is it that you believe you are called to do? And I need to hear something that includes the fact that Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I need to hear something that includes the idea that I'm to go into the world or go, go there for and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And Lord, I'm with you all the way, even at the end of the world. I need to hear something like that. I need to hear that I believe God's called me to go preach the gospel. And when those who hear the gospel receive Christ and are saved, that I am to baptize them in deep water. And that means I put them under the water and bring them out of the water. All right, And after I, I diptize them, then I am to enter them and encourage them to participate in some kind of a program whereby they can learn enough Bible to be able to teach somebody else how they can go and lead someone to Christ and bring them to a commitment to be baptized and become a disciple of Jesus Christ and then learn all things whatsoever he's commanded us. I need to hear that somewhere in their answer. On top of that, I need to hear uh, some clarity on what they mean when they say they're going to preach the gospel. When they say they're going to preach the gospel, does that mean they're going to go tell a nice story that Jesus Christ, who uh, died on the cross, died for sinners, and if you call on Jesus, you'll be saved? I need to hear more than that. I need them to understand that they are commissioned by Jesus Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel, but he specified that we are to preach repentance and remission of sins. So I expect to hear something in their testimony to me that relates their understanding that the gospel means that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for our sins, and that's because we're sinners, and because the wages of sin is death. And then when he died upon the cross of Calvary for our sins, he was buried on the third day, he rose again, and conquered death and hell. And he rose again in a physical body. He didn't rise spiritually, he rose physically. That uh, when he rose again, he went into heaven and presented the blood atonement that satisfied God against all our sin. And that he died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. I need to be, that this person is clear on the fact that when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he died for the sins of the entire world. He died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, 1 John chapter 2, 1 and 2. 
Didn't I just say it a minute ago? You see, that one I want to hear twice. <laughs> I, I want to know that they understand that uh, when Jesus calls us to him, we must repent and believe. They need to understand that Acts chapter 17 verse 30 says that God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. He doesn't give anybody a pass on the command. Nobody gets a little you know, discount card on that. There's no blue light special. It's, in, it's necessary for every man under the sun to repent. It's the weirdest thing that's going on in some of our circles and some circles today, but this notion that repentance really isn't something we're supposed to preach when Jesus said we are to preach repentance and remission of sins. I don't know how it can be more clear. Luke 24, 46 to 48, we are to preach repentance and remission. And so what some have done is they have kind of played with the word repentance and they've gone to the Greek and they found the word metanoia and they thought, they, they noticed there that Mr. Strong indicated and some of the others like Thayer and, and some of the other fellows that, that do that for us and it's good work and I appreciate it. And, and they tell us with this metanoia, that word means to change your mind. And so they uh, come off with this idea that repentance just means changing your mind about something. Well, okay, I'll buy that if what you're talking about is the thoughts of the heart. If somebody is, because the Bible says we are to obey from the heart, that form of doctrine that we have received. The Bible says that we must obey from the heart. And so we must then in the heart repent. That doesn't mean we repent in our emotions. It doesn't mean we repent in our sentiments necessarily or something like this. It does mean that we do what Paul said we must do, and that is turn from darkness to light. Turn from our idols to God. Repentance meant something back in the day when in order to come out of a pagan background or pagan lifestyle, you walked into a Christian lifestyle and there were a whole lot of things that changed immediately. All of a sudden, you had to get rid of the idols that were in your home, and you had to do some things like that. In America, uh, the word repentance has almost lost its meaning because Christians really all around have dumbed down the whole idea of what it means to be a Christian, that there's hardly any difference between being a Christian and being lost. In fact, I find that some lost people have a more clear understanding of what's necessary to turn to God in repentance and be saved than Christians do. This idea that you tell a sinner who says, uh, well, you know, I've got this and that and the other that I do in my life. Well, don't worry about that. Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of all this stuff. You just pray this prayer and then and so on. That's not the way Jesus handled things like that. When a certain woman he was talking to when it came to a certain point where she said, I'm ready, I'll sign on, I'll take water that'll let me live forever, that sounds great, I'll buy in. You know the story, John chapter 4, the woman at the well. Most Christians today would say, bow your head and repeat after me. What Jesus said is, go get your, go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, you, you got that right. You don't. And the man you're living with right now is not your husband. In fact, you've had five husbands and the fellow you're with now is not your husband. Jesus Christ confronted her with her sin. Didn't somebody, couldn't somebody get Jesus, take him aside and teach him one of these soul winning seminars where he understands that you don't, that's not the way you do it. Right? Man, what are you doing, Jesus? She said she was ready. And you go, th you go bring that up? I'm telling you, we've gone a long way from Holy Spirit-led soul winning and biblically-led soul winning. And we're into a whole different, we're into marketing now. I have a sermon I preach, soldiers or salesmen. And most preachers and most Christians today are salesmen. They're not soldiers of the cross. They're selling a product, they're pitching a product, and that's very dangerous. So the right mission, are they going to be committed to the purpose and the work of preaching the gospel, baptizing those who get saved, and then discipling them to go do the same. Are they going to preach repentance and remission? Now what about remission? 
And by the way, I just touched the surface on repentance. We could spend, in fact, our conference coming up this year, the GAP conference is going to go into that in great detail because it's a real big issue these days. But what about remission? There are some ministries that are just all repent, 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 but there's no remission. There's no message in there that says Jesus Christ has paid it all. That there isn't anything else for us to do to add to what Jesus already did. That believing on Jesus is receiving him, and receiving him is receiving a free gift paid for in full by the giver. Remission of sins means that the remittance of our debt has been fully paid. <clears throat> There's nothing else for us to do but to receive the gift that was paid for by the blood that was shed upon the cross of Calvary. Now, anybody who thinks they're going to get saved by faith plus something is not going to get saved at all. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. When we talk about repentance, we mean you turn from darkness to light and some of the darkness you turn from is this idea that you save yourself. This idea that your own righteousness is going to work it out. That somehow you can be good enough to satisfy God's demand for righteousness and God will weigh you in the balances and go, ah, oh, you're not so bad, come in. And I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. The Bible says we are saved not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by His mercy and by His grace. The Bible teaches, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not what we do plus what Christ did or what Christ did plus what we do. It's what Christ did and that was enough. And that was enough. So we must repent in that we turn from sin to Christ. We can't love darkness and want light. It doesn't work that way. Jesus made it very clear. The reason people don't believe, that's nah, not because there's not sufficient light. Truth is, the Bible says, Jesus has lighted every man that's come into the world. The reason people don't believe, it's not because they don't have faith. The Bible says in Romans 12, 3, that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. The reason that men don't believe is simple. Jesus told us exactly why they don't. Jesus said it's because they love darkness more than light. That's what, that's what it is, and that's all it is. They love darkness more than light. And if you ask Jesus, well, Jesus, what is the reason that they love darkness more than light? He's ready with the answer. He says in the same passage in John chapter 3, he says the reason that they love darkness more than light is because their deeds are evil. And they're more comfortable in darkness because then their deeds are not exposed. They don't come to the light because they know if they come to the light, they will be exposed for the sinners that they are. Men like to live in darkness where they can create their own standard of righteousness and satisfy themselves that they're okay. But when the light of God's word shines through that and exposes that sin and says to them that all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags, when God shines his light through that and shows that, as a matter of fact, they will not be judged by their idea of right and wrong, they are judged by God's idea of right and wrong. They will not be judged by their word. They're judged by His. And it's God who's going to do the judging. Not me or anybody else. God will. And Jesus said, If you die in your sins, whither I am, thither you cannot come. There's His judgment. He made it clear. If you die in sin, you're not coming into my heaven. And I rejoice and thank God for it because I would not want heaven to become what earth has become. I would not want Satan to have an opportunity to ruin heaven as he's ruined earth. So I thank God for that ban, that total prohibition. Nobody goes to heaven with a single spot of sin upon them. Oh no, what will we do? For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Oh no, what are we going to do? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross of Calvary for your sins. The wages of sin is death, but Christ died for us. God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we accept the fact that he paid the debt. We humble ourselves to him and to his righteousness and we turn from our own and we turn from darkness and we embrace light. 
He said, Jesus went on to say, those who come to the light, they're the people that do truth. It's interesting that he didn't say in that passage in John uh, chapter 3, beginning at verse 17 and concluding there in verse 21. It's interesting that he didn't say, those who come to the light, they come to the light because they are righteous. He said they come to the light because they do truth. Jesus spoke about that soil that is what he called the good soil. And he said it's a good and fill in the blank heart. Anybody know? Honest. Truthful. Truthful about who he is. Truthful about who they are. Truthful about their condition. Truthful about the fact that this is the word of God. And Jesus Christ is God manifest in flesh and so on. Truthful. They are the people who will submit to truth. A good and honest heart. When the seed of the gospel falls on that kind of a heart, not self-righteous, not I'm so good I get to come in, but just somebody who's honest enough to know that they're sinners and to know that Jesus Christ is not, to know that God is their creator, to know that they are in trouble, to know they need salvation, to know God provided it, they're just honest, that's all. This honest enough to admit and submit to the truth. So we look for those who tell us that they're going to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, somebody that's going to preach the gospel, that's going to baptize the converts, that's going to train them and disciple them, somebody that is going to preach repentance and remission of sins, and somebody who is going to build something called a church. Not some invisible, who knows what it is sort of thing, but a a regularly convening group of baptized believers committed to the task of carrying out the instructions of the Lord Jesus Christ to advance His kingdom until He returns again. People get hung up on this word church. It comes from a Greek word ecclesia or ecclesia. And you've heard me go over this again but uh, before, so hear it again. I, I know enough Greek to know that they're usually about five, seven. No, I'm kidding, Ron. Ecclesia, ek means out. Ecclesia is called ones, and so called out ones is the idea that you'll hear people give as the meaning of the word ecclesia or ecclesia all the time. And they're wrong. The word ecclesia does not mean called out ones. The word ecclesia no, no more means called out ones than the word automobile means self-moving. When I say automobile, do you think, oh, self-moving? No, you think of that vehicle you drove to church tonight or that you'll use to get home, right? Because that's what the automobile is and that's what the word means. That's what the word identifies. The word ecclesia or ecclesia does not identify called out ones any more than the word automobile identifies self-moving. Otherwise, I would qualify. The word ecclesia is a word that Jesus Christ picked up that was coined and in use I don't know how long, I think it's a couple of hundred years, if not somewhere in that ballpark before he picked it up and used it. The word was coined and used to identify a regularly convening group of people appointed by the state to conduct the business of the state for a specified duration, in that case, about a year. I think it was a year. At the end of each year, the ecclesia would be dissolved. And then there would be a general assembly called the Panagyros. This is in the book of Hebrews, by the way, chapter 10. Where the Bible talks about, we are called to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. The general assembly, Panagyros. Again, the Holy Ghost is picking up a word that was in common parlance of that day. The, the uh, Panagyros was the end of the year general assembly that included all of the members of the individual assemblies. So each state or city had an ecclesia. Those ecclesias were appointed persons tasked with carrying out the business of the city or state for a period of one year. At the end of the year, the ecclesia was disbanded, and then they would attend something called the general assembly. After the general assembly, they would go back to their states and they would have a new appointment of persons who are tasked with the business of carrying out the state's business, uh, carrying out the state's uh, activity for the year. And so that was it. That's what the word ecclesia referred to, a regularly convening body of persons appointed to the task of carrying out 
the functions and the, and the business of the state for it. Jesus Christ picked up that word and said, I am going to build my ecclesia. I'm going to build my regularly convening group of baptized disciples who gather together for the purpose of carrying out my business and doing my work till I come back and dissolve all those ecclesias and gather everyone up into the general assembly. Amen. And I want to make sure the people we support understand what they're building. The Bible says we're laboring together with God, so I'm not off base by asking them, what are you out there trying to help God build? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says we are laborers together with God. And that chapter, if you read it carefully, is talking about building up a church on Christ. We are laborers together with God in this work of building up a church. Yes, He builds it, but He does it through our labor. He does it through our work. He told the disciples, listen, the harvest is plenteous. There's not a problem with no harvest together. The problem is we don't have laborers, and the solution is this. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that He will send forth laborers. And I want to make sure the people that we're supporting at Lighthouse Baptist Church are heaven-sent laborers. Who are going into the harvest field to gather fruit unto God and to build a proper church. Not some invisible thing that the Bible doesn't teach even exists. And there's more to say about each of these things that we don't have time to say, so we're done, almost. I also want to know something about their personal separation. I want to know if they're separated. Are they, are they new cart type? Are they going to go out and build some new cart type thing? Are they going to go, you know, paint the building black and get all kinds of weird colored lights going like this and everything? Are they going to try to make the church environment as much like a bar as they can? Are they going to do everything they can to look as much like the world so that nobody can distinguish what they are from the world? Are they separated or are they integrated? Yes, I want to identify with the lost sinner with a broken heart and a compassionate holding out of my hand and my heart to win them to Christ. But the Bible says, Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I'm not smarter than God. He said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He said, Well, the Bible says God so loved the world. Yeah, but he didn't become like it, did he? We're to love the world. Leave loving the world to God. He can do it without losing his sanctification. We love the Lord. We love him first and above all else. And what we do is to please him and not others. We desire the Holy Spirit to do the drawing, not our flesh. We don't want to appeal to the flesh of lost men in order to win them. We want to appeal to God whose Holy Spirit will draw them. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I hope you're hearing it. And so I want to make sure the missionaries we support have that understanding about separation and that they understand the importance of supplication. Are they in the Word? Do they read their Bible? Do they read the Bible that they're planning to preach to others? And when they read it, do they stay with it long enough to get hold of the mind of God so that God can get hold of their heart? Are these little, are they sippers? They take a little sip here and there? Or are they divers? Do they get into it? Do they really read their Bible? And then finally, are they overall word-based or world-based? I already touched on that in the issue of separation. But I'll have some confirmation, with, I'll have some conversation with them where I attempt to explore whether or not I can discern that this is somebody whose life is based upon the Word of God. What they do comes out of what the book says. The, the decisions they make are decisions that are shaped by biblical pre precepts and biblical principles. I usually have this conversation with them somewhere along the way about precept, principle, and preference. And I, I want to have some idea of where, what their understanding is about that because there are a lot of these guys who say, well, I don't bother with preferences. Okay, that's fine. I, don't, I think that's a mistake. You should pay, pay attention to your preferences. So I don't get, get all hung up on the issues of preferences. Well, I wouldn't get hung up on them either, but I'd, I'd like to know something. Are your preferences shaped by precept and principle? Or are you out there just willy-nilly letting your preferences take whatever shape they happen to take, depending on who you're with? 
My preference is those are my personal choices. Yeah, I know, that's right. I'm a slave to Christ. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ. I reckon myself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. I deny myself and take on my cross and follow Him. I do not have the freedom to just make whatever a choice I want. That's a lie Satan has put into the mind of a lot of Christians where they can just throw anything into a category called preference and then let it go. But I want to know that your preferences are grounded upon and justified by biblical principle. And I want to know that the biblical principle is grounded upon and justified by biblical precept. Precept is what God says. There's nothing else to say about it. God said it and so that's it. A principle is a derivative from something God has said. And a preference is a choice you make based on that precept and principle. Did you follow what I said? This idea that preferences are something you can just do whatever it doesn't matter is a complete lie. Our preferences need to be instructed by the Word of God. My choices need to be instructed by the Word of God. I realize there are some differences of opinion with regard to what the Bible says about this and about that. And so we go back to the beginning of the message. I understand we can have some differences of opinion about whether this activity is something that's, that is agreeable to biblical principle and biblical precept. I, we, yes, we can have that conversation. But let's make sure we're having it from the same Bible. And that we're being honest in our conversation. Amen to that? Well, when I talk to a missionary prospect and they satisfy me that these areas are in alignment. And then, of course, I look at their general doctrinal statement and I look for anything in it that might be a problem and I address it with them. Once I've done all that, then they get to come to this pulpit and tell you about their missionary, about their burden and about their, about their field. But until that's happened, they, they're not even welcome to come and present themselves. So that's, that's the work that's been done before they get here. You're welcome to ask them any question you'd like to. You know, if they're preaching, they say something you think, that didn't sound quite right. You're welcome to say, yes, don't go put the big spotlight on them and go, did you mean that? I mean, let's be gracious, you know what I mean? But if you have a legitimate question, ask it in a legitimate way. But by all means, ask the question. And if the answer is something that disturbs you, don't hesitate at all to send me a text or an email or just come to see me or call me and say, Pastor, I asked the missionary this, and here's what he said, and I'm just a little concerned. Believe me, this is important. I had a situation. Yeah, I, by the way, let me tell you right now why I am a stickler on some of these things and why I work as hard as I do to vet these people before they come because we do other things. So we read their, their other letters, uh, their letters of reference, and sometimes I'll call those pastors if I don't already know them. There are a lot of things that we do that I didn't have time to go into. But uh, <laughs> years ago, I had a real burden to go to Russia. You know the story. I won't tell it more than to remind you that I had been praying for Russia for years and years and then God opened the door. And I went to the church and said, I'd love to go to Russia. About a week or so later, one of our deacons was knocking doors in an apartment complex that was next to the church there at Wells Road in Ventura. And because we had a, it was an apartment complex right next to the church that had a very high rate of turnover. So we would go knock those doors about every six months. We'd knock them all every six months. So he was, it was his turn. He was over there knocking those doors. He came across uh, Valeri, who was an immigrant from Russia. So the pastor, I mean, brother, uh, my deacon there, he got excited. And he said, oh, you got to speak to our pastor. He wants to go to Russia. And the Russian guy said, oh, that's good. I've got people he can connect with. So we got that started. So he comes to the church, and now I know he saw the word Baptist on the door, and that's why he did this, but he, refer, he presented himself as a Baptist. And he knew enough about the Bible. He was a pastor in Russia. He knew enough about the Bible to be able, he knew about, enough about what Baptists believe to be able to convince me. He sounded like a Baptist to me. So I let him preach after I did some interrogation. Not as thoroughly as I do now, but up. Just this is where this comes from. <laughs> so I let him preach. Because at the same time, you know, Gospel Light Ministries is located in Ventura. I don't know if you know that or not. Well, they have translators that work on staff there. And at that time, they had two or three different Russian translators. And one of them visited our church. This is all coming together. It's interesting. And this young lady and her husband were visiting our church, and they were Russians, and she spoke perfectly English. So I had her translate. 
She never said to me some of the things she told me later. She was correcting his preaching. Which, by the way, I would have fired her. <laughs> I think I've done a lot of translating work, and if a translator corrects my theology, I never use them again. Now, they correct my, my language or whatever, that's one thing, but not my theology. Not, what I, not the point I'm trying to make. But anyway, so, and he knew enough English to know she was correcting him from time to time. But, in any event, this story is a little bit longer than I really meant to get into. Let's just stop. No, you want to hear the rest of this, so it won't take but a few minutes. So, uh, so he's preaching, she's translating, and I'm not hearing anything amiss. Finally, he comes to me and says, uh, you need to go to Russia and start a Bible college. Now, what's weird about that is that I had been praying about an opportunity like that, that very thing, that very thing, just uh, months before we met him and coming in all this, I thought, oh, what a joy it would be to go and participate in establishing a Bible college in Russia. And I had a vision and a dream. I thought that would be great. So he hit the right nerve on that, see? And I said, okay, well, I'd like to do that. Actually, I've been praying about that, so I think I can, I can hear the Lord in that. And it, by the way, it was the Lord, but it's just interesting how these things work out because I went and bought my tickets. He had me arrange to meet members of his church. He had started two churches in Kiev, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, thank you, in the Ukraine. So that was gonna be my first stop. From there, I was gonna go all over. And uh, I think it was like Monday was my flight, and I believe it was Friday night. One of the members of our church, John Loya, you guys met him. Yeah, the thing about John Loya is you just gotta, you, you've got to know where he came from to be able to appreciate where he is. But anyway, he's in heaven now, praise the Lord. Well, there's another great story, but anyway. So uh, John Loya calls me. He says, Pastor, that guy's a flaming Pentecostal. I said, what? No. Said he is. He tried to get me to speak in tongues. You gotta be kidding me. Not say one thing about John is he's really a very honest person. Sometimes so honest, he'll make you uncomfortable. But he's a very, very honest individual. And so Valeri made a mistake in messing with him, that's for sure. But so I believed him. I know John's gonna lie about something like that. So I called Valeri and he admitted it. I said, You've been lying to me this whole time. He says, It's okay. I said, It's not okay. I learned a lot about the Russians later, and a lot of Russians felt that way at that time. It's okay. Ends justifies the means. So he said, Dude, you know God wants you to go. And I thought about it. I said, I do believe God wants me to go. I don't understand this, though. I can't start a church with people that believe the way you believe. I mean, I start a, a, a college. So we had a conversation. He says, you have too much in your brain, not enough in your heart. Like, I've never heard that one before, you know. I said, well, you know, I, I am concerned about, you know, knowing the truth. But I do want it to be in my heart. And so he said, I am going to pray tonight that all these books, and I had all my books at that time, I had them in my office. Now I keep my office at home. It's a little different arrangement. But uh, had all my, 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 my whole office was just surrounded with all kinds of books. And uh, I'm going to pray all these books will be on the floor tomorrow morning. And then you will know that I'm right and you're wrong. I said, okay, I'll take you up on that. I said, and you know what else? I hit, this is interesting. I said, I'm not even going to lock that door. You can try to come in here and knock these books off the shelf, but you won't be able to. I'm going to leave that door unlocked, and I won't be here, and I'll pray that you will not be able to knock, because that's what you're planning to do, Valeri. And he kind of looked at me like, he didn't deny it. And so the next day, I showed up, he showed up all sheepishly. He said, I just couldn't do it. I know you couldn't do it. And this was fascinating. So I didn't get much distance with him, but I sure didn't schedule him to preach while I was gone. And before I left, I got hold of that young lady, and I said, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm so, she said, I'm so glad you discovered this. So what's with you Russian people? Why don't you just, you know, tell me? So anyway, I said, we'll have to have more conversation later on. She was redeemable, and she got straightened out. She's done a real good job with the Lord's work. In any event, I go to Russia. What was the point of this story? I don't want to tell the whole story. Oh, yeah, vetting. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't sufficiently. But I, so I get there. Just a long story short, I get there, and I 
we saw some exciting things happen and some amazing stories that I could tell you some uh, another time. But the long and short of it is I finally had to say, are there any Baptists around here that I can work with? Because I can't start a college with you guys. In a friendly way. We, 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 by the way, we, we parted friends. And they said, we're going to study what you've taught us, and we'll see. So I met a pastor who just, it's one of those things, God put our hearts together. He just fell in love with what God was doing in my life. And, and likewise, my heart was knit with his. And we just bonded. It's just one of those weird things that happens every now and then. And um, he got on the phone after we preached. Uh, by the way, they, in that situation, they call all the men together for a prayer meeting before they go to the pulpit, before they go to the platform. And the pastor usually points, appoints three people to preach. Comes out of 1 Corinthians, I can't go into it right now. But they appoint three people to preach. And he kept looking at me and then going to somebody else and looking at me and going to somebody else. And then finally he looked at me and said, I want you to preach. So I did. While I was preaching, he was watching and then looking at the audience and looking back at me and he was absolutely enthralled. And all I was doing was preaching a simple sermon on soul winning. Because, you know, in Russia, they couldn't do that for so long. So I wanted to preach, let's, hey, you've got freedom now. Let's get out there and start knocking on the doors and, you know, house to house. Let's start. And so I threw that challenge out there, and he absolutely loved it. So our hearts were knit together, and he set up my entire itinerary for the whole trip. And one thing led to the other, and we did end up being able to start a Bible college with a missionary of like mind and like heart. And God did bless that work, and it's ongoing even now. It's a, it's a, it's a blessing how all that worked out. But I learned from that, brother Bruno, it's really important to vet them thoroughly. Okay, that was what that story was about. Let's stand together. We're done. Let's stand together. You know, there are all kinds of ways to participate in missions. Jesus said, pray ye the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. One way to participate in missions is to pray for missionaries. Pray that people will, in our own church, be stirred up by the Spirit to reach out to their neighbors and to reach out to others and to participate in our organized efforts to reach our community. Get involved in prayer, and then you do it too. You be a soul winner. Amen. Be a missionary yourself in your own circle of influence. Another way to participate in missions, of course, is to go. If you believe God has called you or stirred your heart to, to set yourself apart to a field of service and to go and give your life to that work, then let us know. We'll do everything we can to help you prepare and then to support you when you're there. So you could go. Another way you could participate is to send. You can get involved in the missions giving and send somebody or support somebody who is going. That's another way to get involved in missions. In each of those opportunities, you are investing your life in the work of Christ. I mean, you're getting as close to the heartbeat of God as you can get who came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen? So are you involved in missions on some level? While we sing this invitation, you respond to the Lord. As he's spoken to your heart, you respond to him.